on this edition of Great Lakes Now. Wisconsin tourism businesses reopened despite COVID-19 concern. I don't like to be looked at as if I don't care about my fellow human. I really do. I want everybody to be safe. A lawsuit over flushable wipes. Instead of saying flushable toilet wipe, say do not flush. That's all I'm trying to do here. And our region continues to adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams. The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. The Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at DPTV. The Polk Family Fund. Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, Founders Brewing Company, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Detweiler. Welcome to Great Lakes Now. Communities around our region and around the world are having problems with fatbergs, massive sewer clogs we first showed you in fall of 2019. Well, in the past few months, the problem has gotten worse. Will Glover brings us an update. In September of 2019, I went to Macomb County, Michigan to visit the Clintondale pump station. Well, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Where I met with Public Works Commissioner Candace Miller. A very interesting and pungent place. <laughs> yes, I it guess. is. It's pungent because this station pumps sewage. And in 2018, in a sewer line not far from here, they found what's known as a fat bird. Let's just cut to the chase. We're here to talk about fat birds. So what is a fat bird? Well, a fatberg uh, is something that sometimes sewer systems, uh, they're found in the sewer system. Macomb County found one made up of greases and oils that people have put down their drain rather than disposing of them properly in their garbage. And our particular fatberg was 19 tons, 100 feet long. 100 feet long? 11 feet wide and six foot tall. That was our fatberg. Fatbergs have been found in sewer systems all over the world, and they can make raw sewage back up into your basement or get released into rivers or lakes. They're caused when disposable wipes are put into the toilet instead of the trash. The wipes can tangle up into a kind of ropey rag ball, and when grease and oil and dirt and trash get caught in it, well, now you have a fatberg. So sewer systems have to remove the wipes before that happens. How do you get this stuff out of the sewer or out of the water system? Well, what you can see here is what we call the rake. And so this thing literally goes down very deep into our wet well here. And it is pulling up these, these wipes, these rags as we call them. And they dump them right into a bin, right? A trash bin oh, here. No. A big dumpster. Oh my goodness. That and is so terrible. we get uh, several of these dumpsters a week mm -hmm. at this particular facility just full of these uh, wipes. If you think it looks bad, you should try smelling it. It cost Macomb County $100,000 to remove their fat bird, and most of it is now in the landfill, but some of it was taken to Wayne State University's Integrative Biosciences Center in Detroit, where Tracy Baker looks after it. So you have an actual piece of the fat bird here in this lab, correct? That's correct, yes. And so, were you really excited when you found out you were going to be working and studying a fat bird? Were you like, yay? <laughs> I was a little maybe timid at first. Yeah. Carol Miller had um, contacted me asking if I would be interested in studying the fat bird. Uh, I had to kind of look up what a fat bird was, was before say, I made that know? decision. Carol Miller, no relation to Candace Miller, was the driving force behind getting the fat bird into the laboratory. I'm uh, very interested in what goes through our pipes, so when this huge backup occurred in Macomb County, I thought, wow, this is exactly my sort of stuff. I'm very interested in this, and so, maybe we can help solve the problem. Part of the research involved picking through the fatberg to find out what it's made of. It's pretty nasty. So your hands are in the tank, you're right. moving stuff around. So we're just looking to see what we can find in the fatberg. It's mostly plastic and wipes. We found a bunch of tampon applicators, and we can see like sheets like this, 
which is just um, wipes, looks like. Yeah, it just looks like somebody's trash can. Fast forward to 2020. With the COVID-19 pandemic, many stores couldn't keep disinfectant wipes in stock. So I talked to Candace Miller and asked if she's seeing more wipes in the sewer system. About a 400% increase. Yes, it's crazy. Where we would normally get maybe 1,000 pounds a week, now we're getting four and 5,000 pounds a week. Every day we go to work with fingers crossed that we're not gonna have another fat burg or, an, or some sort of clog in the interceptors because of all of these wipes. Federal laws about wipes have been proposed, but the bills are stuck in congressional committees. So on May 6, 2020, Commissioner Miller took to YouTube to make an announcement. We're gonna file a lawsuit now, because I keep asking people to see if I can't get the federal lawmakers or the state lawmakers to file some legislation not to stop them from making these, they're fine. Just don't flush them down the toilet. So change the packaging. Instead of saying flushable toilet wipes, say do not flush, non-flushable, non-flushable, do not flush. That's all I'm trying to do here. Change the packaging. Wipes are made of non-woven fabric. Dave Roos is the president of INDA, the Association of the Non-Woven Fabrics Industry. What does he think about Macomb County's wipe troubles? We certainly identify with the problems that Macomb County is having. Uh, there are too many wipes being flushed that should not be flushed. But the problem is not those that are marketed as flushable wipes and pass the seven tests that render them so. Rather, we have a very strong labeling campaign to put the do not flush symbol prominently on non-flushable wipes, and we're trying to get the public to pay attention to these disposal instructions. And you should pay attention. A lot of the wipes we're using are not flushable, and they're marked with a do not flush symbol. I guess it's kind of prominent, right? Inda has even produced videos starring the science mom to help you understand which wipes you should flush and which wipes you shouldn't flush. But what makes a flushable wipe flushable? The flushable wipes are 100% cellulose, wood-based or cotton-based cellulose. The fibers are held together to have the strength needed at the point of use, but then they are that, that strength is, is uh, liquidated once the product is flushed. The bonds dissipate and the material passes through the wastewater conveyance system and ultimately biodegrades in the, in the treatment process. But maybe you want to see if the wipes break down when they're really flushed. That's been tested at Ryerson University in Toronto. Associate Professor Darko Yuksinovich supervised the research, so I got in touch with him. This research was undertaken by uh, Ryerson Flushability Lab, so let's start with that word. What is flushability? Flushability is a very uh, undefined term uh, at the moment, uh, uh, and it basically pertains to the ability of products to be safely conveyed in our wastewater systems. There are a number of different standards for flushability. The wipe industry uses its own standard, but the Ryerson research followed a standard developed by the International Water Services Flushability Group. And the international group we found to be more um, representative of what actually exists in wastewater collection systems. Ryerson grad student Anum Khan conducted much of the research in the flushability lab, which mimics the typical household drain line. We have a setup of a toilet with a, about 18 to 20 meter pipeline where we simply flush the product down and see whether or not it comes out in one flush. If not, then we keep on going. So that's one of the tests. And then the second one is disintegration. So we simply put the product into a slosh box and slosh it back and forth um, to see how it performs in water. And then the third one, which we're currently working on, is settling. Will it remain floating or will it settle to the bottom of the tank? If it sinks to the bottom, uh, it can cause a lot of different problems. So that's where the buildup begins. 101 wipes and other products were tested. Some were labeled flushable and some weren't. They range from baby wipes, cleaning wipes, cleansing wipes, paper towel, facial tissue, and even dog waste bags. Did you say dog waste bags? Is that something that people flush? Um, they are labeled flushable, so it was included in our list how many people are flushing it that I am unsure of. I hope it's not very many, because that doesn't sound I right. hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> After all these flushable and non-flushable products were tested, what were the results? Not a single product actually passed the test. There wasn't a distinct difference between those that were labeled flushable and those 
that didn't have that label on it. Some of the products that were label flushable would disintegrate more, but not sufficiently to pass this, this test. One recommendation that came out of the study, eliminate the word flushable on product labeling. So if you want to avoid fat bergs and sewage spills, wipe with whatever you want. But when it comes to flushing, stick to toilet paper. For more of our Fatberg coverage, visit greatlakesnow.org slash Fatberg. With the arrival of summer weather, the first pandemic era tour season began around the Great Lakes. Wisconsin business owners were among the first to welcome visitors. On May 13th, the Wisconsin Supreme Court overturned the governor's safer at home orders. As the first state in the region to fully reopen, business owners saw the return of out-of-state customers. Wisconsin Public Radio journalist Corey Hess reported that the sudden influx of traffic began raising health concerns. In Illinois, the number of coronavirus cases is significantly higher than in Wisconsin. So I think some of these border, border businesses, border cities are worried about the people coming up here. I mean, they've always welcomed tourism, but in this time of a pandemic, I think they also are a little nervous. Tourism is just one factor contributing to the business community's mixed feelings. Business owners that I've talked to have described this loss as worse than the Great Recession of 2008. Uh, they've had to lay off people, they've had to furlough people, they have gotten loans, federal loans, but that hasn't really helped them. I think a lot of business owners don't want to be looked at as the bad guy though for reopening. Debbie Glenbaki, owner of the Brat Stop in Kenosha, a restaurant, cheese mart, and concert venue close to the Illinois border, still feels torn about reopening. There are some who get critical and say that, you know, we're just greedy business owners. I feel bad that I don't want anybody to think badly of us. I just, we're just trying to make a living. I, I don't like to be um, looked at as if I don't care about my fellow human. I, I really do. I want everybody be safe. I just think it's up to them how they choose to be safe. For small businesses that depend on visitors, safety guidelines became ambiguous after the Supreme Court overturned the governor's executive order. There has been some mixed messaging between our state health officials and some of the Republican leadership and the Supreme Court. And I think the interpretation really just depends on how people personally feel. If you decide you want your staff to all wear masks, and, and follow all, you know, the gloves and the plastic wrapped silverware and all that stuff, you know, that's great. But I really don't know that you should be critical of those that don't follow your exact guidelines. And it, it, it's just, it should be up to you, I think, how you run your business. The governor's administration is still urging safety and restraint. It means the Wisconsin Department of Tourism's message remains cautionary. Dream now, travel later. Yes, the state's reopen, but you don't have to be out. You know, please stay at home. That's really been their response. Although for Debbie, reopening is her only choice. It's my family business. Been here, like I said, since 1961. And my dad passed away last year and I don't want to lose something that's been here forever, and I take it personally. So if I'm not, you know, if we're not open and running the way we always have been, I don't know how we can stay open. 200 miles north of Broadstop, Door County is saying they're also ready to reopen. We all know this will be an unusual season. And we are preparing our businesses so everything is safe for our staff and for you when we can all get back together. We certainly have different messaging this summer than we initially had planned to when we put our plan together late last year. But, you know, again, what is key for Door County and for any travel destination is going to be to take some basic precautions, wearing a face covering, practicing social distancing, just being responsible and kind about things, respecting a business owner's, you know, whatever they're asking their customers to do. And if we can do those things, I think we'll all be able to get back to doing what we love, and that's traveling here this summer. Not all Door County business owners feel the same. We have had some that were not open over Memorial Day weekend. They opted to, to hold off. Um, and there are still some businesses, and I, I, I suspect that we'll see 
uh, altered business operations in a number of businesses throughout the summer season in 2020. One local distillery, known for its craft bourbon, decided to go all in on their new side hustle. It seems like our industry uh, kind of doubled down and saw an opportunity to make hand sanitizer since the main active ingredient is alcohol. Um, so we did the same and we started at first donating it to local hospitals and uh, a couple of the elderly communities here and some first responders. And then interest grew and grew and grew and pretty soon our phone just kept ringing. Also, everyone comments that it smells so good and that it smells like bourbon. The switch to sanitizer inspired a collaboration with other businesses. Kane Gettleman, owner of a trade show banner business that now prints custom masks, teamed up with Hatch to form a sanitizer delivery service. I reached out and I said, you know, Chris, I think we can do something for the businesses. What do you think about, I'll go out and figure out how to do the dispenser portion of this thing because you can't even buy pumps right now. While Hatch will supply the sanitizer, Gettleman's company is sourcing automatic dispensers and a local newspaper is handling deliveries. Over 300 local businesses have already signed up for the program. As for the public health payoff, well, it's quite literally in the hands of patrons. I don't know that everybody is going to do it when they walk in a door. I don't know that I can post somebody there. But with the right signage and the right encouragement, and when it's universally available, um, washing your hands or using hand sanitizer instead is far less objectionable. Let's put it this way. I haven't seen anybody in a position of leadership attack the idea of cleaning your hands. Okay? That's why it's going to work. As of mid-June, Wisconsin Department of Health reporting does show new COVID-19 cases are trending downward. However, there's been concern that large crowds gathered for the Black Lives Matter protests could drive numbers back up. Social distancing is out the window at these protests. If there is a spike because of the protests, they might have to, to start closing down again. But businesses, like the Broad Stop, just may have something to say about it. I don't think just from talking to the business owners that I've spoken to that if they see coronavirus cases spike in their community that the majority of them will be willing to close their doors again because I, I just I think that the losses that they've taken are just too much. For continuing coverage of how Great Lakes states and provinces are responding to the pandemic visit greatlakesnow.org. COVID-19 continues to change how we live and work around the Great Lakes. We checked in to see how some of the people and industries we've shown you in the past are moving forward. Last June, we introduced you to Planted, a hydroponic farm in Detroit. At the time, they were delivering greens and microgreens to local restaurants. With the COVID-19 pandemic, that client base dried up and Planted had to find a new way forward. We decided that we wanted to take the risk to stay open. Since we made that decision, we've sold almost every leaf of lettuce that we've grown. Hygienic procedures in place, Plant had jumped into the ready-to-eat salad business, making door-to-door -door deliveries across Detroit and beyond. Quickly, the Detroit market showed us that they really did want to continue to buy local produce, which is wonderful. So we took the opportunity to pivot if we go right to the customer, then we're able to offer them slightly lower prices. Just seems to be a real win-win. We're still growing microgreens, greens, and herbs, and we do put some of each of those categories into every ready-to-eat salad. But then we're also gonna be buying from some of our friends for additional fruits and vegetables and nuts that will go on top of the salad. As always, margins are a little slim for us because we're growing in this high technology environment but we're still building. We're constructing our next two grow rooms. We just started this week when the new executive order allowed for construction. Um, so when we have that supply available, then we'll have even more volume and hopefully even more affordable prices. We really hope that people understand the value of local foods because now all of a sudden we're intimately aware of how interconnected our world is. And when any aspect of it shuts down, then it really does compromise our ability to feed our families. In Lake Superior, off of the Keweenaw Peninsula, lies Buffalo Reef, a vital spawning site for whitefish and lake trout, but it's under threat. Chris Kurleski is the director at the U.S. EPA's 
Great Lakes National Program Office. What we're dealing with in Buffalo Reef is literally 22 million cubic yards of what we call stamp sands that were generated by um, the copper production industry. Over time, that huge mass of material, which was piled up on shore, it's sloughing off into the lake itself and moving out towards and covering the reef. The mining waste has already covered five miles of shoreline, and it threatens the fish that spawn on Buffalo Reef in two ways. One, it contains copper. If you have much of an accumulation, more than an inch thick, um, it can be toxic, um, both to plant life and to fish life. The bigger problem that we're struggling with right now is the sand being a very fine particle as it washes over the reef, when it fills in those spaces between the cobbles, it's no longer available for spawning. The fish on Buffalo Reef are vital to commercial and recreational fishing and to the Keweenaw Bay Indian community. So the lake bottom is being dredged and piles of stamp sand on the lakeshore were moved away from the water. They got rid of those vertical slopes and pushed that material um, as far back as they could to try to make it look much flatter and much more level. So at least you didn't have that huge potential amount of just piled material ready to fall into the lake. It's a step, but no permanent home has been found for all that stamp sand. People are working very hard but uh, finding a long-term solution is not going to be easy. Ed Verhamey is an environmental engineer at Lemnotech, which created and maintains the buoys that act as a detection system for harmful algae blooms in Western Lake Erie. Because that data helps safeguard Toledo's drinking water, Ed's work is considered critical, and it continued despite the pandemic. We didn't always know that these monitoring projects were, were critical. When we started monitoring the Great Lakes in real time and making data available, these were research projects that were mostly funded with um, academic researchers with the Toledo water crisis and monitoring um, harmful algae. This is the first time we, we really had to ask folks, is this critical infrastructure? And the answer was yes. These plant operators rely on this data to understand what the lake is doing. I mean, the goal of, of having these sensors is so less people have to go in the field um, to check on the bloom. Our university partners are really struggling, you know, being classified as research and, and professors and students. They're not quite as able to get those critical designations and their support systems aren't as strong. So it's gonna be a much different community monitoring the, the bloom this year. One of those university partners is Laura Johnson, director of the National Center for Water Quality Research at Heidelberg University, where water sampling had to be scaled back. With the pandemic, essentially our campus has been closed since spring break. We do want to protect our technicians in our lab, and so the question has been, well, what is what are the critical samples and what aren't? Typically what we do, we have 23 sites, we usually take three samples a day. And the reason we do that is because if we get a big storm, we want to capture all of the changes in that day. So the first thing we did was we were like, well, we're not doing that anymore. The center sampling effort now prioritizes the Maumee River, which brings in most of the agricultural runoff that fuels the Lake Erie algae blooms. We did go out um, just today to collect samples and we're analyzing prioritized samples right now. So not everything. We are doing everything we have for the mommy because that's directly linked to the bloom. So it's not as informative as normal Heidelberg quality data is, except for the mommy and we're going to at least have one sample a day for there. Mother Nature's cycle of understanding it, like it doesn't stop, it doesn't change these relationships. So we're going to miss a, a, a big gap in research this year. To me, bloom size and bloom severity is critical, and it's something that the whole community needs to understand and be ready for. Captain Dave Spangler has been running fishing charters on Lake Erie for 29 years. In a normal year, his bookings start the 1st of April, but this year, Ohio's stay-at-home order meant he couldn't take customers fishing. We lost all of April, so there's four weeks, and the first two weeks of May, before we did get the okay to go ahead and start May 12th. So that business is lost for this year. I've had calls that people had already had one booked and they called and said, we're just not comfortable. We don't think we'll come. We'll reschedule next year. I've had that part. And then we've had uh, about the same calling. Okay, we wanna go fishing. Things aren't exactly back to normal though. Certain precautions must be taken for safety. I only put four people aboard the boat instead of six. 
uh, and I do the extra cleaning that we're supposed to be doing to make sure that the next crew that goes on is not going to have any any effects of what we what we did from the previous day. Right now, the fishing is fantastic, uh, and there is a reason this place is called the Walleye Capital of the World, and uh, it is it is that good out there. So I guess to anybody that wants to come, call a charter and get out here and go fishing because it is unbelievable. Thanks for watching. For more on these stories and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams. The Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. The Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at DPTV. The Polk Family Fund. Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, Founders Brewing Company, and viewers like you. Thank you.